I've been doing the Let's Say videos now for almost a year and have enjoyed the conversation they've created. Not only are the videos themselves fun to consider, but I have seen some great suggestions in the comments as well. We've covered the Sega Saturn, the Sega CD, the 32X, the Turbo Graphics, and even the 3DO. But without question, the most requested system that I get has been the Sega Dreamcast. The original release of that console held so much promise, so much hope, that its ultimate commercial failure was one hell of a bitter pill to swallow. But how do you turn around a console that was basically dead on arrival because its parent company was in so much financial distress? Let's face it, Sega was already well on the path of ruin before the Dreamcast even launched. After considering that, I genuinely thought the episode would be terribly boring, because it would have involved rewriting far more than the history of the Dreamcast itself. We'd have to go to the inner workings of Sega, and how it handled its business, and who wants to get into that mess for 30 minutes. Yet the requests kept coming, so in this episode, we are going to take on the challenge of saving the Sega Dreamcast from certain doom. To keep things within reason, we are doing this from the perspective of taking over in 1997, as the hardware is being finalized. Remember, this is all in good fun, not meant to be an attack on the people that made the original decisions, and aims to create some good-natured conversation. This is a long one, so let's get started. You really can't begin this discussion without first addressing the market performance of the Sega Saturn. During the 16-bit era in the West, Sega owned as much as 50% of the market with the Genesis. Saturn did so poorly in the years after that by 1997 those numbers were down to single digits. There is no question that Saturn is a viable, sustainable platform beyond 1997 was a lost cause outside of Japan. But the way that Sega just cut off support was simply unacceptable from both a consumer and public image perspective. There needs to be a much smoother transition from 5th to 6th generation, and our first order of business is to plan a proper exit strategy for the Saturn. As 1996 comes to a close, we stop all major internal development for the platform in Western markets. That means we will lose games like Mr. Bones, Three Dirty Dwarves, and Sonic R. The good news is, is that we still have numerous Japanese releases to be localized for the US and European markets, and that's what we focus on to carry the Saturn until our new console replaces it. Sega had developed a terrible reputation for abandoning its platforms at the time, and we need to save face and keep that from happening again. 1998 already has some great titles like Burning Rangers and Panzer Dragoon Saga coming but we also need to get the likes of X-Men vs. Street Fighter and Wipeout XL released in the United States. There are a number of fantastic games in Japan that we could easily bring over that would require very little translation. We don't need a ton of releases, we just need a market presence so that Sega is not out of sight or out of mind when it comes to the gaming public at large. Well-timed drops of important titles will still let people know Sega is supporting the Saturn and give us easy sales income while we transition to our new platform. Sega's management had allowed internal competition to grow into a toxic environment during the 1990s. It's well documented how the Japanese and American teams butted heads on countless issues. This trend continued into the Dreamcast era right from the start. While it's not unusual for different ideas to be presented about the direction a company should take with a future product, Sega allowed Japanese and American teams to fully pursue alternatives independently. Long story short, this was a major disaster that led to Sega being sued by 3DFX and having to pay them $10 million at a time when Sega couldn't afford any such nonsense. That $10 million could have supported a number of additional Japanese releases for the US Saturn. We will not follow this ludicrous strategy, and we will instead employ one single team to develop the hardware for our 6th generation product. It is imperative that we avoid any indecisiveness, 
any internal conflict and any wasted time or resources. Sega had allowed its internal teams to flex their muscle in the arcade for years, and that competition was great for innovation. However, once it spilled over into management and it began to affect how Sega was run, the powers that be should have refocused its efforts to root it out and get everyone on the same page. Those that continued to be cancerous to the long-term survival of the company should have been cut out regardless of their past successes. Sega needed hungry employees that would go the extra mile, not tribes of pissed off man children putting their emotions before their job. Now that we know we will drive a single research and development team, we will be going with the Doral, or White Belt as it was also known. This was a pairing of the Hitachi SH4 CPU and the PowerVR graphics chipset, a cost-effective choice that was important for the machine's long-term viability. There are only a few changes I'm making here, but they are important. The first thing we are doing is increasing the system RAM from 16 megabytes to 24 megabytes. This is about long-term strategy and giving developers more to work with since there are three competitive consoles releasing shortly after our machine. We cannot be deficient in this area to the point where it handcuffs third parties when they consider porting their games to our platform. Both the PlayStation 2 and Xbox had quite a bit more RAM than the Dreamcast originally. This helps with that sum without adding a ton of extra cost. We will also be cutting out the proprietary GD-ROM format in favor of a fast standard CD-ROM. To get around the reduction in available data, we will use dual-sided CDs that can hold 1.4 gigabytes. We will also be using a custom disc mount when dealing with the labeling. You know how a standard CD typically has a hole in the middle and then a transparent area around that? Well, our special disc will be filled in with a hard label that fills this area of the CD. This label will then have three small proprietary holes that lock it into the specially designed spindle on our new machine. That accomplishes a number of things. First, it gets around the ease of standard consumer level CDs being used in our product. Second, it still allows us to use a technology that is mass produced and very inexpensive. Our disc will look different, have an eye catching aesthetic and help circumvent piracy, at least at the novice level. Our CDs will also only boot with our strict OS security measures, and we will not be supporting mill CDs this time around, or any other type of self-booting media in any way. The final piece of the puzzle is that we make it known from the get-go that Sega fully intends to support DVD movies with a low-cost add-on that will be available at launch. PC DVD drives have been dropping in price significantly year to year at that point, and I am confident by the end of 1999, we can get a DVD add-on out to the consumer for $149. Even if we have to sell it at cost and don't make a dime on the hardware, it's really important to have a DVD options consumers have easy access to. We will also play up the importance of having a separate drive playing your movies so you don't put wear and tear on the CD drive in your system. The eventual trouble that Sony has with the original PS2 FAT models failing will reinforce this messaging. We can also drive DVD sales with special DVD versions of multi-disc games. I feel this strategy is incredibly important in Japan. A small head start on the PS2 with DVD available early will make a load of difference in the interest for our platform. It is well documented on my channel that I am not a fan of the Dreamcast controller. I hated the shape the directional pad. Hell, I even hated the wire that came out the bottom. This thing needs to be redesigned completely. The main thing is, is we need two analog sticks. It's true that most games at the time had not started needing them yet, but our main competition is Sony, and their DualShock controller has it. Since the bulk of third parties are heavily entrenched in development for them, it stands to reason that any trends, any control advances, will happen with the dual stick option. Both Microsoft and Nintendo realized this, and both of them used dual sticks in their 6th generation consoles. You simply do not offer less than your competition, 
and the original Dreamcast controller wasn't prepared to give gamers everything they needed for future software. I do like the VMU screen idea, so we will build the LCD screen into every controller. Each controller will have a screen of its own, allowing us to sell cheap memory cards that will simply slide into the slot on the console itself. I also want a full six button face like the Saturn analog controller. This isn't just for fighting games, but also gives us the extra buttons we need since we only have one set of analog triggers. The directional pad also needs to be like the Saturn's analog controller. This is for fighting games and an absolute must. Our new controller will be thinner, easier to hold, and feel much better in your hands. We will finish off our new design with both a start and select button beneath the new LCD screen. Online gaming was a big part of the original Dreamcast strategy. Sega thought it would draw consumers in droves. It wasn't ready at launch, however, nor was it widely adopted. Sega spent a ton of money getting its online service SegaNet ready, and that's money they really didn't have to burn on a technology they practically had to give away in regions like Japan. To add insult to injury, many of the top games weren't even released in the West with the online support intact. For example, Marvel vs. Capcom 2 and Virtual Lawn Oratorio Tangram supported online in Japan, but not anyplace else. I really admire Sega's innovation and forward thinking, but with the company and the state it's in, we need to be focused on the health of our core business model and not dropping countless millions into services that will take years to turn a profit. The PlayStation 2 modem didn't launch in North America until nearly two years after that device hit the market and we will adopt similar thinking. Once we get our new system healthy and we know it will survive, we can then put forth an online strategy for the second half of the console's life. With that in mind, we will be dropping the modem that was included with the original Dreamcast. We will have an expansion port there for the broadband adapter that we can sell later, but otherwise, online gaming is not a priority for us in the beginning. I was never a fan of the name Dreamcast or the Swirl logo that went with it. I know in the many years since it's become iconic, but back before the console launched most of my friends and I scoffed and made fun of the name. Frankly, Sega had the proper name for its new console already. While the machine was still in the final stages of research and development, the project was being called Katana, and that was the name it always should have been. The Sega Katana could have had such an awesome logo, and I do not believe I was the only one that didn't think much of the name Dreamcast originally. In fact, Electronic Gaming Monthly ran a poll before release where Katana was by far the more popular choice when used against Dreamcast and the other prototype names. I know the name Dreamcast has a powerful draw because of nostalgia and our personal experiences with it, but looking back pre-launch, I feel Katana is the way to go. While planning our new business strategy, I came upon a realization that hurts me to the core to say. During this stretch of time, Electronic Arts decided not to support Sega's new console. As the story goes, Electronic Arts was unhappy with Sega's choice to use PowerVR for its hardware and then further angered when Sega refused to let EA Sports handle all the professional sports releases. This soured a relationship that had been strong for years, and EA and Sega would part ways. It really wasn't so bad at the time because Sega and Visual Concepts would go on to make the 2K games, all of which were absolutely awesome. But we are talking business here, and that changes everything. The simple truth is we need electronic arts. We need those early Madden, NBA Live, and FIFA titles. We need ports of Need for Speed 3, SSX, Medal of Honor, and Road Rash 3D. These games have a market presence and a sales potential that simply can't be overlooked. Many of them would also happen to look better on our console than any other port available at the time. In our new timeline, we turn over all sports development to Electronic Arts and bring them on board as a third-party developer. There is also another point I want to stress. 
Without a sports lineup of our own, Sega doesn't need to buy visual concepts. Sega doesn't need to waste money on league and player licenses. Sega doesn't need to invest in development of multiple new franchises. Sega is hurting for money at this point, and these investments add up to a large sum of money that can be redirected back into our company. Having Electronic Arts on board covers our sports needs, helps our cash flow issues, and gives us a number of popular games we never received originally. I hate to do this. It's soul crushing to make the 2K games disappear, but for the sake of long-term viability, it has to be done. Third parties are an important aspect of any console's well-being. The original Dreamcast did okay in this regards thanks to being much easier to program for than the Saturn. Even Namco showed up with a small amount of support in the beginning. But if we are going to make our mark with the Katana, we need something more. We need to bring a number of games to our new platform that gets people's attention. Since Sega has in the past worked with developers to secure popular IPs for their hardware, I plan to attempt the same. I want to secure the license to Baldur's Gate, a PC RPG that was exceptionally popular in 1998. If we can get the license, we could get a developer on it and do the porting duties and get it out for the Katana in late 1999. This game was not available on any other console back then and I feel our new system could really benefit from this type of release. The gaming media at the time put this on a pedestal and it had a ton of hype behind it. We would need to zoom in the perspective a bit and streamline the interface, but this could be a huge boom for us to draw in those that appreciate the genre. I would also like to get the license for Sin, the first person shooter from Ritual Entertainment. I really think this one would add even more variety to our lineup. I always thought the story and design to this game was ahead of its time. How you interacted with the level determined how you progressed through the rest of the game. The enemy AI was also pretty advanced, kind of like the reactions you got in Halo a few years later. The action in this one would be a great change from the lineup we saw originally, and I think another solid addition to our library. First party support was a strong point for the Dreamcast, and we're going to make it even better on the Katana. First, I would want to purchase Lobotomy Software in 1997. This team of talented developers would not be wasted, and we would make them an important part of the Sega-owned studio lineup. Their first project is a direct sequel to Power Slave that will be exclusive to our platform. This Metroid-style first-person shooter would evolve even further, while giving us more of what made the first one so memorable. I would also put Sega AM2 on a Katana port of Daytona USA 2 Championship Edition. This would be not only the full versions of both Daytona USA 2 arcade games, but also include all the tracks from the original Daytona, as well as the tracks from the Saturn Remix. This will be the ultimate home version of Daytona, complete with upgradable cars that can be customized and tailored to your playstyle. You can go heavy on the drifting mechanic or keep it glued to the road. We could even add in the horse for good measure. It was criminal that Daytona 2 was never released at home back then, and we will change that in a big way. Another big move I want with the Katana is a second chance for some of the Saturn's best late-in-life game titles. The simple fact is, games like Panzer Dragoon Saga never got the audience it deserved. This was an RPG that would benefit heavily from more hardware horsepower, as well as a fresh audience that would appreciate it. That's why I'd have Team Andromeda begin work on a proper Katana version of Panzer Dragoon Saga with upgraded VGA visuals, improved full motion video, faster load times, and exclusive content that gave RPG fans even more to love. While we're on the subject of games that deserved more love, I also feel Burning Rangers needs a sequel on the Katana. Not just a sequel, but a fuller package that includes the missions from the first game, as well as three more to expand the adventure. We will take a game that pushed the Saturn to its absolute limits, and make it prettier, run better, and pump up the special effects even further. I also want a proper Fantasy Star 5. I'm talking a real sequel in the same mold as the previous games, with visuals as nice as what we saw in the eventual online games. 
With SigaNet being pulled and the online strategy changing, we should have the internal resources to get this new fantasy star back into the gaming public's hearts and minds. We're going to give Sega fans more of the reasons that made them Sega fans in the first place. What I'm about to do is going to rock some of you to the very core, and I apologize with all my heart. But from a business perspective, I feel it is absolutely necessary for Katana's long-term viability. Shinmu, the classic Sega adventure game, will be cancelled after it becomes clear that Saturn is not going to sell well in the West. It cannot continue development beyond the early stages. It cannot explode into the black hole of money that Sega could never possibly make back. It cannot tie up Yu Suzuki and Sega AM2 for years. I know this is not something that's going to please many of you, but from a business standpoint, Shinmu was an unmitigated disaster that helped contribute to Sega's ultimate demise. Despite selling 1.2 million units, it failed to make back the money Sega had invested in it. We need that 50 to 70 million dollars to help get the games made the Katana needs. We need games that will make a profit so that more games can be made. AM2 is one of Sega's greatest assets and we need software from them that moves hardware without crushing us financially. I know this will be unpopular, but Shenmue didn't help the Dreamcast survive and it's gotta go. The advertising for the Sega Dreamcast wasn't bad, but I want a different direction. The It's Thinking campaign didn't attack Sony's PlayStation 2 hype head on, and we are changing that. I want a slew of ads that make multiple points about the price of the Katana, the arcade power of the Katana, and I want a counter ad campaign in place to combat the hype of the PlayStation 2. I want the clarity of our VGA graphics played up. I want the point that many of our early games look better than any of the PlayStation 2's launch software. Sega's attitude during the Genesis era was to slap the competition and make your brand look like the cooler option. We need that aggressive confidence again with the Katana. Now that we have everything in place, it's time to launch the Katana. In Japan, we will release our machine in early August of 1999 with the pack-in Virtua Fighter 3 Team Battle. The Japanese Katana will be released later than the original Dreamcast there because I want more software, more units on store shelves, and I want that DVD add-on ready to be sold right beside it. I feel all these things are extremely important for our launch there. The Sega Saturn has sold well in Japan, and we don't need Katana there in 1998. In the US, the Katana will be launched on $9999. The Dreamcast originally had a solid lineup of launch software, so we will do nothing to change that. Well, except we are packing in Sonic Adventure. I know this is going to have a major impact on software revenue, but we need a push that's going to make the Katana the gaming system to own at Christmas in 1999. In Europe and other PAL territories, the Katana is going to launch in November of 1999, also including Sonic Adventure as the pack-in title. All regions will be priced at $249 or the proper equivalent currency. Our pack-in strategy should be popular, and with the modem not being included, our new price should mean Sega takes no losses on the hardware. We will also go a step further by offering a special Katana Elite console that will come in the special color of red, include a VGA box, and retail for $249. I want the superior VGA output to be a serious talking point of our hardware. I want consumers to know how much better it can make their games look. With any luck, this should drum up some hype and get people talking about the graphics capabilities of our hardware. The first year the Katana is on the market is incredibly important. We will have sales milestones to meet that will make or break our console business. In order to give us the best hope of survival, we need to employ a fluid model of adapting to how the market is performing. Month by month, we will adjust our pricing with flash sales on our game titles. We will do different pack-in bundles for various genres. 
we will give consumers many options to meet the needs of the market. At the end of the first year, just in time for Christmas, we will drop the price of the Katana to $199 and keep the pack-ins in place. We should also be able to get our DVD add-on right around the $100 mark, a price that PC vendors were also starting to meet on their DVD drives. Perhaps the most important thing to remember in the first year is to get our management on the same page to fight to the bitter end. If all of the changes in this episode are going to work, we need everyone on board to fight the good fight until there is no path to victory. I think the later release in Japan will give us the extra time we need to get things right there. More software at launch, a DVD add-on, and no shortages to muck it all up. If we can move just an additional 3 or 4 million units, the Katana may just have a fighting chance for the long haul. So there we go, my attempt to save the Dreamcast by turning it into the Katana. If you like the ideas I put forward here, I would love to know of any additions or changes you'd make to the strategy. If you absolutely hated all my changes, the good news is, is that it was all just make-believe, and you still have everything as it originally was. One thing I can tell you is, is that losing SegaNet, Shinmu, and 2K Sports was a tough call. I didn't want to do it, but Sega was strapped for cash and we needed to tighten our belts for the battle ahead. It's also not lost on me that a Katana and separate DVD drive would cost more than a Sony PlayStation 2 which is why we need to really drive the point home that it's the better option for the long-term health of your hardware. Having two drives, one to play your games and one to play your DVD movies, means you are splitting the duties. If the Katana does survive to be competitive in 2002 and beyond, this strategy should be a self-fulfilling truth when fat PS2s begin having their disc read errors. The biggest challenge for Sega if history did allow them to continue further into the sixth generation is what to do when the GameCube and Xbox show up. Sega will have the advantage of being the cheapest option on the market, and if they keep pushing those PC ports, keep up the great third-party support, and keep bringing home all those great arcade games, there's a chance here that Katana could move just as many units as Nintendo and Microsoft. And that there is my final point. Sega wouldn't need to outsell Sony for their platform to be a success. A Katana that sold 25 million units would have made a world of difference for Sega. It would have meant a ton more software being sold and a chance for Sega to emerge from its problems without the need to merge with Sammy. Like many of you, I'd love to know where that reality would have led us. I'm Sega Lord X. Thank you guys for watching, and I will catch you next time.